everyone, Lynn Smith here, and welcome to Stroller Coaster, the podcast that takes you on the wild ride of parenting that we're all on together. Created by Munchkin, no wonder they're the most loved baby brand in the world. Joining me here, Justin, as always. Hey, Justin, how are you doing? Hey, Lynn. I'm doing great. Uh, it's book fair week here oh, always in a my household, so it's uh, book talk all day long. All day long, my kids at the book fair always look for books that have toys in them, and I'm yes, always they're like- they're trying to sneak a toy. They're sneaking a toy. <laughs> Can we just focus on the books? No, I mean, we're in the first grade over here, so reading is such an important topic in our house. We're trying to get our son really in the habit. I mean, I started reading with my son when he was weeks old, and it was something that became a ritual every night, holding him in my arms, pointing at things, and just seeing his imagination and his eyes light up from when he's tiny, tiny, tiny. You could see that he was having a reaction to it. It's just such a special connection you can have with your kids. Yeah, it's emotional. It's this like cross-generational connection. It is something that, you know how people always say, you're going to miss these days. You're going to miss it. I think about that all the time. This is such a chance for us to bond with our kids. And so today we wanted to bring in some real talk about how our children's brains actually work when it comes to reading and some practical advice on how we can get their skills going at an early age. We're going to talk to Dr. David Pearson. He's a brilliant professor and a thinker who's dedicated his life to studying how kids learn to read and also also the best ways we as parents can help them do that. It's such great information. And then you'll hear a story from a parent right there in the trenches with us. Emily Verode. She's using books to change the lives of her children. This is such a great episode with a one-two punch that's going to make you excited to work on reading with your kids. So let's turn the page. Let's get going. Dr. David Pearson has done so much. He's authored more than 300 books, taught for many years at UC Berkeley, and became renowned for his work around literacy and understanding how kids learn to read. Dr. Pearson, thank you so much for being here. I'd like to dig into this big question of what actually happens in a child's brain when they start reading. Well, it's interesting you should ask that question, Lynn, because we couldn't have answered that question with any definitive research 20 years ago. But more recently, we've been doing these images of what happens in the brain while people read. And these studies tell us the following, that the first thing you do is you see the squiggles on the page, what we call letters, sometimes organized into words. And you pass through a phase where you actually turn the letters into some kind of, almost like a mental sound representation. Mm -hmm. And from that sound representation, then you transfer it into language and meaning. And that's when the magic of understanding occurs. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting because I'm watching it happen with my first grader. He's learning to read and watching his mind work so hard. How does it affect the child? Well, just think about the options that await a child as they learn mm -hmm. to read. The child who learns to read really has two worlds available, the world of firsthand experience and the world of books or what you might call secondhand experience, right? Both of these worlds are available for learning and for enjoyment. And the cool thing about reading is that once you learn to read, you can take these journeys on your own. By the way, yeah. I have some colleagues who like to make a distinction between learning to read and reading to learn. And mm. the idea is, is that, well, you spend the first few years of in school learning to read. And then once you get pretty good at it, then you can read to learn. It's not a distinction that I like. I think kids are always reading to learn, even when a parent, a grandparent, sibling, a tutor is reading to them. They want to know what's inside that book. Conversely, I'll be 82 in two months, when I think I still have a lot to learn, not only about the world, but about reading. Mm -hmm. And I hope I'm still learning to read for a, a, another couple of decades. How do we teach that to kids, that you are you are going into something that's going to be a lifelong gift. We've got to make sure that reading is always associated with interesting, exciting, pleasurable experiences. My friend and colleague, Scott Paris, likes to say that reading requires skill, will, and thrill. So when we teach reading in schools, we try to mix up the skill acquisition with the thrill of playing the game. And those two together can help kids sustain the will to become real readers, readers who can do it on their own. Exactly. You know, my son's teacher reached out to us and had concerns. And so she actually had 
us do something at home where he read to our dog. And we noticed that it was really easier for him because there wasn't some of that pressure. I, I'm fascinated with the example that you brought up. I've got a 10-year-old granddaughter, Jane, and uh, my daughter, Susan, sent me a video just last week. She and Jane are down at that local humane society, and Jane is reading to the cats. She's holding up the book just like a teacher and showing him the picture. And she asks him, ask, ask him a few questions about, now, what did you think about that? <laughs> Things like yes. that. And I thought it was so cool. Yeah, our pets don't judge us. We love them unconditionally, and they love us back that way. So we can fail in front of them and not yeah. feel that self-conscious. It, it's worked for us. So I know that there are two schools of thoughts when it comes to why reading is so important. Can you break down what those two are? Yeah, well, this relates to kind of a, a debate in the field about when kids learn to read. I consider them more complementary than I do at odds with one another, but we do have these two approaches. One I, I like to call the just do it approach, and the other I call the Sherlock Holmes approach. And the distinction is is that the first one, just do it. We teach kids skills, particularly the foundational decoding skills, how to move from print to, to speech so that kids can get that part of reading under automatic control and they don't have to pay a lot of attention to it. But reading doesn't always go smoothly. Sometimes you can't figure out what a word says or you can't figure out what it means or you say, my goodness, I just read this last page and I don't remember a thing about what I read. And then you get out of that automatic just do it mode and you go into what I call the Sherlock Holmes mode where reading is a puzzle and you have to mm. solve that puzzle. You use every resource available to you, including everything you know about the language you've been learning and all the knowledge that you've acquired about how the world works. Mm -hmm. So what I want our schools and our preschools and our parents to do is to remember that there's more than one way to read and we want kids to be skilled at both of them. Yeah. And I think this is something that we don't want them to just have a skill set. We want it to be a lifelong journey. How do we instill that? I'll say my mantra that I, when I'm on a plane yes, and please. someone, I tell them what I do and they ask my advice and I always tell them, <laughs> I always tell them, read a lot, write a lot, talk a lot. I can't stress enough the importance of talk that helps young kids make sense out of the world that they see, the world they hear, smell, taste, and touch, the world right around them. In that process, it'll pay dividends when they learn to read print in a book. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to reading, every parent should read to their kids, they should read with their kids, and they should read in spite of their kids. You read to them so they get exposed to great stories, poetry, and information about how the world works. We read with them so they see how you turn those squiggles <laughs> into things that make sense. Even from when they're very young, they're taking in everything you do. So they'll be able to learn how to turn pages, how we read left to right, at least in English. And that third piece, reading in spite of your kids. When kids see their parents reading, it says that reading is important. It models the behavior. It shows them that it's worthwhile and something they can and hopefully will do the rest of their lives. I haven't read a book, I feel like, in seven years. I listen to audiobooks, but I don't, especially as a busy mom, have time to sit down and read for even it feels like 15 minutes. How much time should we as adults dedicate to reading? And how much time should our kids spend reading? We have some very good research that shows that even when kids go from reading zero minutes a day at home, to reading 10 or 15 minutes a day, they shift in their achievement from scoring, let's say, at the 30th percentile to reading at about the 65th percentile. Uh, so I, I think that we could uh, set that as a, a lower boundary, uh, 10 or 15 minutes to be reading uh, to and with the kids. How much time should you be reading as an adult? Well, as much as you can. We wouldn't want a world in which print didn't matter. So uh, let's keep it around as an important medium right up there with all the new wonderful forms of multimedia we have for learning and enjoyment. A lot of this stuff is available digitally, but let's not forget trips to the library and how important the library can be as a resource for kids and as a place to hang out. 
almost like an amusement park for your reading mind and a place to take kids where they can see really how the magic of books and reading play out. So many great ideas on how to just immerse yourself and your kids into this gift of reading. Dr. Pearson, yeah. thank you for such incredible information. Well, thank you, Lynn. It's been a real treat to interact with you. You know, Dr. Pearson really took some of the pressure off that I've been feeling of, is yeah. he learning to read quick enough? Is this clicking? And it's like, this is not a race to see when he's going to feel really comfortable. This is an experience for both of us. It's for the whole family. Yeah, he talked a lot about how reading activates multiple parts of our kids' brains. So I dug a little deeper and found a sort of surprising stat I wanted to share with everyone about just how busy our kids' brains are. So by the age of three, the brain is more than twice as active as an adult and stays that way for the first 10 years of life. Wow. So our kids are sponges. That's yes. why reading to our kids at these ages is so important. They're just craving this information from us. Yeah, soaking everything in. And to go a little further, children's academic success at age nine and 10 can be attributed to the amount of talk they hear from birth through age three. So every moment matters. And those same children who are exposed to early language and literacy prove to be good readers later in life. So I guess the lesson here is keep talking and keep reading to your kids. We teach our kids to read because it's a skill they're gonna use for the rest of their lives. But how can reading help our kids right now? Emily Verode is a mother who couldn't imagine that reading a book to her son could actually change his life. So here's our correspondent Fleece with the parenting story of the day. Emily is a mother of two who was racking her brain to try and solve an issue she was having with her son. It started when my son was like two and he couldn't stop hitting. I should mention, he's my first child. So every small aberration in behavior was like, oh my God, he's a sociopath, something's wrong with him. You know, I was sort of running off the deep end. So I reached out to my pediatrician and she was like, well, that's very normal. So she said, you know, there's a book and it's called Hands Are Not For Hitting and you should buy that book. And I was like, great. And then I sort of read the message again and I was like, a book? That's not what I'm looking for. I don't need a book. I need a solution here. Despite her misgivings, Emily was ready to try something new. So once the book came, she dove right into it. He really took to it. He thought it was funny. And this is a very simple book. It's sort of like, hands are not for hitting. What are hands for? Hands are for saying hello. Hands are for eating a snack. Hands are for throwing a ball, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this was not, you know, grand poetry here. And, you know, there were no magic bells. He didn't change right away. I think it was later that week or even maybe the next day, he started to hit. And I found myself being like, hands are not for hitting. And he was like, oh, hands are for saying hello. And I started to realize perhaps it wasn't that he wasn't listening, but perhaps those statements I was making, which has been saying, don't do that, or I won't let you hit me, or that's not nice, didn't connect to anything. And therefore, they just didn't compute. So all of a sudden, this book gave us a language to sort of attack the problem. And in the moment, I mean, he was two. I didn't really need to know, like, why are you hitting or what's behind the hitting? I really just needed him to stop hitting. It was really a game changer for us. It was sort of like a light bulb went off in my head, which is funny because I'm a reader. I'm a literary person. I've been reading my whole life. I write for a living. My husband is the same way. And we had been reading to our kids since they were babies. But it had honestly never really occurred to me to use the book as a tool for communication and collaboration and back and forth. When you unlock the power of reading, it can open so many doors into how we relate to our kids and give us as parents new ways to approach problems. Since then, we've really turned to books in all situations. When he switched schools, we turned to a book. When we're going away, we turn to a book. Even when there's like a new Jewish holiday or something I just need to explain, I turn to a book. Anytime I have something that I need to have a conversation about, I start with a book. But there's not a book for every situation. So sometimes you have to dig a little deeper and get creative. We really started with stuff that was very basic. Now my son is three and a half. And so we've sort of gotten a little bit more conceptual than we had been. And now we've been reading about really more feelings and emotions. For example, earlier this year, he had been begging us to take a dance class, literally for like months. And so we signed him up for a dance class and he was so excited. There was so much anticipation. We got to the studio. He chatted up everybody outside the studio. He was so friendly with the teacher. 
And then he went into the class and he stood in the corner and he crossed his arms and he did not participate. And I was like so surprised that this is, I should also caveat that this is like a kid who's like Mr. Mayor. We never run into this situation. And so I had no language to talk to him about this because I had never even expected I would be in this situation. And not to mention that the mother part of me was like, what are you doing? Like all the other children are participating. Get in there and take your hands off your chest. And, and, you know, at the moment, I I don't even remember what I said. And then, you know, I went and I tried to find a book, which was very hard, obviously, because there isn't a book about a boy who doesn't dance in class, even though he loves to dance and normally isn't shy. However, I found something that, you know, I could improvise off of. So we found a book called The Smart Cookie, which was not a direct corollary. But I changed some of the words and I added things like I was so scared to participate a couple of times throughout the pages. And on like the fourth or fifth time, he started to say things like, oh, you know, sometimes I feel like that. Or why did she do that? And, you know, did it cure the dance class situation? No, but it gave him something to relate to. It showed him that people who are scared can still do a thing. And so really, we use books, honestly, in that way all the time now. So if he's having a tantrum or if he's having a strong emotion in real life, oftentimes I'll reference a book. I'll say something like, oh, wow, it seems like you're really mixed up. I wonder if you feel like the color monster. That said, it doesn't always work. Like I said, my son is three and a half and I'm embarrassed to say that he still has a pacifier. And we do have a book called Pacifiers Are Not Forever. And we have read that book many, many times. And we are still very attached to our pacifier. So it is definitely not a fail safe. You know, we have the pacifier books, but we don't really care about them. And when we do read them, he changes the story. So at the end, instead of like a girl being happy that she doesn't have her pacifier anymore, he adds the line and then she wanted it back. So, you know, this is not a fail safe. We do not always come out on top. But for the most part, it's been great. Emily learned that reading is the beginning of the conversation and a way to give our kids the first few steps on a lifelong journey of literacy. So often, as parents, it's a very one-directional conversation. You know, you need to do this, or you need to stop doing that, or, you know, it's always me driving the ship. I'm always the one saying where to go, what to wear, like who we're going with. And I feel like what this sort of thing has done is it's really given us a way to create a two-way conversation. It's a way to sort of make their opinions feel just as monumental as whatever I'm saying. And it also allows me to be in this place where I'm the person who's questioning and who's unsure And they are, quote unquote, the expert, for lack of a better word. So if I'm saying, I wonder what's happening here, or I wonder why he's feeling sad, it elevates them to this point of being like, oh, oh, wait, I know this. It's been like a real confidence booster, which for me is like the most important thing. If I can give my kids one thing in this entire world, it would be confidence. I think that is honestly like the most important gift I can give them. And I would say this does that for me in a lot of ways. Now, I should also say it never ends with the book. The book for us is always a starting point. And it's not usually happening when we're in front of the book. It's usually later on in my day when we're doing something, I'll say, oh, remember, we saw this in a book. Or if I know that we're going to do something that feels foreign and unfamiliar, like we're trying to get them to learn how to swim now, and the pool is not something they're super familiar with. So we're reading a lot of books about swimming and pools so that when they go there, they will have something that feels, oh, I know what this is. I've seen kids in a book do this. And so, you know, it's always a way for me to just sort of have something to touch back on. Because I feel like kids love familiarity. They like to feel like they know what's going to happen. I think that's why they watch the same TV show and they listen to the same song and they read the same books. You know, and it's funny. It's like I'm watching it now happen again. I have a daughter who's two and we're back to our originals now. We're back to hands are not for hitting. And the other day I saw she was about to hit me and she stopped herself and she said, oh, nope, not for hitting. Reading gave Emily instant results. But beneath that, it gave her and her kids a way of connecting as a family. I think the act of sitting together and reading a book before you even get to anything that book is about is already powerful. It's like a moment of connection. It's a moment of settling down. It's a moment for family time. It's often the time where we come together either as a full family or like if my husband and I are reading one-on-one with the kids. So then that's a time they get alone with a parent. And so I think before you even talk about like difficult subjects or something you're trying to get out, that first building block is just the connection of being together, whether you're reading something important or not. And now, you know, anytime anybody says we're having a problem with this or whatever, I'm like the biggest proponent because books have truly just been a game changer. Justin, I think a big takeaway here is books aren't magic. Sometimes they don't connect, but when they do, wow, you see, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, you have to um, give it a shot. That's why I like Kids' books, are, they're short. You can read them and find which ones work. It's different. Just between my two daughters, some books are the, our older's favorite, others are the younger. 
You've mentioned to me in the past that Charlotte's Web is a favorite in your house, right? Love you forever. Favorite in our house. There's always tears at the end of that book. And my son will turn to me and be like, are you crying again, mom? I'm like, yeah, well, because someday you're going to be rocking me in my rocking chair. But in all seriousness, I mean, reading is this magical bond with your child. It's a huge task, but I feel a lot better after the conversations today. I hope you do too. And that's the show. Thanks for taking the wild ride with us. And I want to thank Dr. David Pearson and Emily Verode for joining us. And as always, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, share it with your friends, spread the word. And as always, thank you to Munchkin. No wonder they're the most loved baby brand in the world. And you can find all of your favorite Munchkin products at munchkin.com. At Stroller Coaster, we're all about community. So if you have a question or topic that you want to hear more about, just reach out to us at podcast at munchkin.com. Hey, Justin, you also have some big news in story time, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, if you don't know, story time is our podcast for kids and parents where we tell classic children's stories in our own brand new way with improv actors. It's very fun. And we just released a brand new episode. It's our take on the classic stone soup story, except ours uh-huh. is called Rock Soup because it <laughs> rocks. Here's a clip. Grandma picked up a rock from the ground and dropped it into the pot. Rock soup, of course. Rock soup. Rock soup, rock soup, rock soup. I'm headbanging over here with you, Justin. I knew it. I knew you would. <laughs> rock it out. Justin, tell us where to find it. Uh, it's right here in the same feed. It's called Stroller Coaster Storytime. Check it out. Before we go, Munchkin invites you to join us in helping make the planet a better place for our kids. Support organizations that protect animals and their natural habitat, like IFA the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And now that you're ready to do something for the planet, here's something you can do for yourself. Take a time out. Today, let's feel the wind on our face as we make our way up to one of New Zealand's stunning mountaintop forests. It's home to the distinctive kiwi birds. Did you know there are five different species of these fluffy birds? They actually don't fly, and they're all cherished by New Zealanders. Thanks to the efforts of many local protection groups, the kiwis endure as a living symbol of New Zealand's exquisite wildlife. Enjoy. Enjoy.